Welcome to today's video and, and sadly, tragically, we've passed the 1 million official deaths uh, milestone globally. We know the real number's higher, but that's the official number of of deaths globally now from COVID-19. So always appropriate to um, to remember that it's a statistic, statistic, but it's a lot of individuals. Now, um, I've got some news today from the United States, from the UK and from Europe. Not particularly good, to, to be fair. Um, but we'll look at it as objectively as we can and I'll be providing evidence for what I'm suggesting. So let's start off with the United States first of all. Now, um, remember Dr. Redfield, uh, director of the Center for Disease Control, is saying that 90% um, of the American population is still vulnerable to this virus. In other words, about 10% have probably had the virus, about 33 million Americans uh, infected so far. Thankfully, most with very mild illness, but we know that the, there's been a lot of very ill people and we know there's been a lot of deaths as well. But the point I'm making is if 90% of people are still vulnerable to the virus, there's not that much immunity around. 90% of people are not immune. There's a lot potential long way to go before we get vaccines. That's the point I'm trying to make, really. And we'll see why it's so important today, because things are going wrong in some parts. Um, now, this is this is the overall uh, sort of graph for the United States here. And we do see that things are going... Uh, Definitely things are going up again now. There is an increase in cases. And this is for the Centre for Disease Control. The question is, what's it going to do now, of course? Um, it could carry on going up. Uh, it would be nice if it went down again, of course, but I don't see any particular reason why it should. I do fear we're going to get some increases in the United States as autumn approaches. Um, no one knows that, of course, but I'm going to give reasons for why I'm concerned. Um, now, New York City. Now, this is really disappointing. Um, New York City, we, we know we're probably up to about 17, maybe even 18 percent of people have had the infection, therefore have a level of immunity. In my view, probably a good level of immunity. And we were hoping that would give some sort of herd immunity that the reduced cases we've seen in New York for the past few months now could be due to this community herd-based immunity, but it appears not because cases are rising again now in New York City. And um, it's probably largely spread through indoor gatherings. Um, and public schools, I believe, all over New York City are opening this week. So let's just say that opening all the public schools is not going to reduce the transmission. It can only increase it. So that's a concern. But New York is talking about new restrictions again. Private schools and essential businesses may close. So a kind of, OK, you could argue whether these are the appropriate responses. But um, th th there's an awareness that perhaps something is going to need to be done soon as disappointingly cases arise arising again in New York. Brings me on to the bizarre case of Florida, and this is really, really bizarre for Florida. Um, anyway, I'm just going to try and give you the facts um, as I understand them. I did report on this a few days ago, but the impact of it didn't quite hit me. So um, I've been thinking about it again. So Florida is to lift all COVID-19 restrictions, according to ABC News and various other news outlets. Now, Florida's had quite a lot of cases. It's had 16,000, 16,500 new cases in the past seven days. And also, concerningly, the positivity rate is, is between 533 and 7.54%, according to leaked data reported by uh, ABC. So we see that the infection rate, and the infection rate is that, so if you take 100 um, antigen swabs in Florida, then five, six, seven of them are coming back positive, that kind of percentage. Now, the World Health Organization become concerned if that's over 5%. So if we're talking about 6% positivity, that, that's the problem. Because what the tests do, of course, is they, they tend to pick up the more poorly people, the symptomatic people meaning there's a lot of unrecognised infection in the community. So what this is telling me, if the positivity rate in Florida is 6%, that tells me there's a lot of ongoing community transmission in Florida. That's, that's, that's what it's telling me. So how has the state governor responded to this? 
Uh, if you'd like to contact me and tell me I've got anything wrong, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to talk and to listen. But um, these are what I understand. This is what I understand. Um, so fines for not wearing face masks are being removed. Uh, restrictions on all businesses, restaurants, bars lifted. This is actually really quite hard to uh, to believe that uh, someone in the responsibility of a state governor would act in, in this way. Um, throughout the United States, bars have been a constant source of uh, infection drivers. It's known for many, many states, bars are a real risk factor. I mean, fortunately, I think the weather in Florida is still fairly warm, so they can have plenty of ventilation. Let's hope they do have plenty of ventilation. But uh, alcohol and viruses, as we know, often don't mix very well because of the behavioural change induced by the alcohol. So um, that's my understanding. Um, if I'm wrong, Governor, do, do, do inform me, but that's my understanding. Um, every business has the right to operate, according to the Governor. Uh, some of the locals can do reasonable regulations, but you just can't say no. And a full Super Bowl NFL in Tampa in February. Now, let's hope the uh, the NFL um, squash this one straight away um, and don't play along with this, um, th 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 this suggestion because widespread vaccination in Florida will probably not have occurred by February. We're probably talking... It'll hopefully have started by February, but it won't be widespread. So February is just a bit early, I'm afraid. Now, local governments, um, the governor has graciously allowed local governments in Florida to uh, implement limited restrictions. So local city and uh, county governments in Florida may implement restrictions. But, and this is the, again the way I read this, it's a heck of a big but, the onus of proof is on that individual um, area, or I'm a bit zoomed in today. The the, the, the onus of proof is on that individual um, area. So um, it looks like if someone wants to introduce restrictions, they the, the, the onus of proof is on that person to to justify it. Um, quite frankly, this this change begs credulity at this critical time as we approach autumn. Now, um, why do we have restrictions? Let, let's just remind the governor um, why we have restrictions. Uh, the population of Florida is about 21 and a half million. Um, so that means if 10% of people have had it, about 2.2 million people in Florida are immune. That means 19 million people from Florida are not immune. They are susceptible to this virus. Most epidemiologists are still saying that this virus will carry on spreading in a community until about 70% of people are infected. Now, you could argue about it. Is it 60%? Almost certainly not lower. Is it 80%? Almost certainly not higher. 70% is probably roughly where we are at to achieve community-based herd immunity with sars coronavirus 2 causing COVID-19 disease. So that means that there's 13.3 uh, million that's uh, so that that, that 13.3 million is 70 percent of that uh, there's 13.3 million in Florida uh, people could potentially get infected uh, that's my understanding let me say it again my understanding is 13.3 million people in Florida could become infected if this virus is just allowed to do its own sweet thing most of them will be uh, minimally symptomatic have mild disease um, maybe 20% will be asymptomatic. But 5% could potentially need hospitalisation. Now, our, our Prime Minister is a good example of this, Boris Johnson. So he, he had the disease back, well, back in March, was it? Probably March. Anyway, when he came out of hospital, he said for him, for a few days, it was touch and go. Now, let me say what that means. That means he could have died. Now, that means they would wrap him up in a shroud, take him down to the morgue and then burn him or bury him. This is this is has no more uh, greater import than this. It was touch and go. This is what he said. And he needed oxygen, I believe, for two or three days. Now, if it was touch and go with oxygen, without the oxygen, I think it's very likely he would have died. So a relatively simple intervention, giving oxygen, 
And in those days, we didn't know about the efficacy of dexamethasone, which we do now. But just a few days oxygen and a life is saved. But that's because oxygen was available, the healthcare facility was available. Um, so there's potential for if 5% of those people get sick, uh, between now and full vaccination, there's a potential for well over half a million Floridians to require hospitalization. Now, I don't know about the details of the hospital situation in Florida, but I suspect they will be unable to cope with 665,000 patients in the next few months. I suspect that is the case. Um, now, if the death rate is 0.03%, uh, as we may well be, um, that would be 40,000 deaths in Florida could occur. Now, these aren't predictions. These are I'm, I'm not predicting what's going to happen. These are warnings. You know, th these are warnings. These, But I think you can see from what I've said, I've said nothing ludicrous so far. Let's hope I forgot some massive major factor and it's all going to be fine. But this denial strategy is just not... It's just not consistent with the nature of reality, unfortunately. Um, now, of course, that 0.03% death rate assumes hospital care is available. Uh, if it's not, then that 0.03 could rise significantly. And if over half a million Floridians need hospital care, I think I've made my point, Governor. This is the warning I am giving. What this means is it is up to individual Floridians to take precautions to, to be careful because it looks like your governor is not enforcing it. If I'm wrong, contact me, tell me. But that's my understanding and I am gravely concerned and I've had quite a few emails uh, from local citizens expressing incredulity and indeed uh, extreme anger. Um, now, um, let's just look at a few uh, few graphics from the state. Oh, yeah, that, that's why I wanted to say that one. Um, yesterday, I wrongly criticised the Centre for Disease Control. They had updated their guidelines on symptoms for COVID just in the past few days, I believe. But apologies, uh, unless they just updated it overnight, I got it wrong. Uh, let's look at what they're... Uh, certainly a few weeks ago they hadn't mentioned it, but they're updated now. So let's look at the updated version now. So this is uh, this is online, live from the uh, symptoms of coronavirus. So uh, fever or chills, cough, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, fatigue. Good, they've got fatigue in as an early common feature. Muscle or body aches. <clears throat> Headache as an early possible common early feature. New loss of taste or smell. Sore throat, congestion, runny nose, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. So that's good. Um, that is now nicely up to date. Now, in terms of the, the other states in jet in the states in general, um, the, the reproductive numbers the R in real time is high in quite a few states. Um, two weeks ago it wasn't so bad. A month ago, perhaps not so bad, but. Um, this is the latest. So cases are increasing in many states. Florida that we've just looked at, the real-time value is 0 0.05 there, according to this, that statistic. So um, let's hope it doesn't rise above one as a result of the easing of those restrictions. Um, but I am I'm fearful. Now, hospitalizations in the States, thankfully, um, not too bad at the moment. Now, this data here is about 10 days out of date. Um, but we can see it has come down quite nicely. Let's hope they stay down. Um, but we do know that the deaths in the United States have remained stubbornly, uh, stubbornly high, unfortunately. OK, moving on from the States. Um, all, all, all the links, let me just show you. All the links that you would want are in the description, of course. Don't take my word for it. Click on it. These are all links I've clicked on myself where I get the information from. Now, moving on to Europe. Uh, let's just start with a uh, shot here. 
uh, increasing cases in Europe, Spain, France, United Kingdom, Italy. Now all of these are adjusted per capita. They are already adjusted per capita. So Italy is doing well. Um, the United Kingdom, France, Spain, not so well. But while I'm on this, I just wanted to show you Israel. So remember, Spain was quite high. So this is the um, this is the situation in uh, in Israel. Way way higher than Spain. Let's hope these cases are starting to come down now as a result of the interventions that have been taken in Israel. So. Um, Europe's bad, but, but Israel Israel's worse. Now, um, Europe, <clears throat> it's kind of Europe really, batch of Sputnik 5 sent to Belarus for clinical trials starting the 1st of October. Where have I gone? There we are. Starting the 1st of October. Um, so this vaccine is being rolled out in anger. Now they're calling it clinical trials even though it's been approved. Um, what do I think about this vaccine? The evidence does seem to show it is inducing an immune response. So I'm expecting, don't know, because we haven't got the evidence, we don't know. It's the old point, we haven't got the clinical trial data, we haven't got it, um, but I'm expecting it to be efficacious in terms of generating an immune response. Therefore, I expect to bring the in number of new infections down in Russia and uh, Belarus. I expect it to bring those numbers down. What we don't know is how safe it is. We simply don't know that the trials have not been done. But it looks like they're being done now, so... Um, I'm not saying they've done things wrongly in Russia. They've just sort of given it approval before they've done the trials. Now they're doing the trials better late than never. But the published data so far from Russia uh, regarding Sputnik V is, uh, is not good. I mean, I mean, it's not, the, the data looks like there's efficacy, but the data is not comprehensive is what I mean. There's not a lot of data for peer reviewers to, to, uh, to crunch. Now, moving on to the uh, United Kingdom. Um, so that was the number of new cases from tests yesterday, the day before, the day before, and the day before. So a greatly increase in numbers, but the COVID symptom tracker app, that's the figure on from yesterday. That's the day before, that's the day before, that's the day before. So we see that these numbers, the number of new symptomatic cases, is about three times higher than the number of positive tests. Now, it might be that the COVID symptom tracker has, app has gone completely wrong, but in the past it's correlated well once we get the data from the Office of National Statistics in three or four weeks' time. So if it's gone wrong, it's gone wrong all of a sudden. Therefore, I suspect these are genuine numbers, I'm afraid. Uh, this significant increase in cases in the UK. Active cases, well over 200,000. Now, just to put this in some kind of context, um, we've calculated that at the very peak, just about the time of lockdown in the UK, um, there was probably about 200,000 new cases per day. So it looks now we're getting near to 20,000 new cases per day. Then there was 200,000 new cases per day, we think, based on later serological surveys, even though there was only about four or 5,000 new cases officially reported because we were greatly under testing at that point. So we're not back to where we were, but um, the, uh, the COVID symptom tracker app people are saying we could be back to May levels in three weeks. If this rate of increase uh, continues if the regional restrictions throughout the UK at the moment um, don't have the effect we'd like them to have. <clears throat> so um, now based on uh, 800 and, uh, 847 swab tests, okay it's a bit out of date um, but that's saying this is a possible increase but based on this um, if anything now it's probably higher are not in England 1.4, Scotland 1.3, Wales 1.4. Whatever it is, there is no question we are in a, an exponential growth phase, albeit from fairly low numbers. But there's no question that the R values in all countries of the United Kingdom at the moment are well above one. Therefore, cases are going to greatly increase just as autumn starts, which is the time that we are, of course, worried about. Now, in the last seven days, 
this is the COVID symptom tracker app data again. Uh, no, 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 no. no Northwest cases have tripled from uh, 12,500 to 36,000. So the, the cases have tripled in seven days in this. This is the this is the Manchester, Leeds, Liverpool sort of a corridor area. A great increase. Northeast and Yorkshire more than doubled in seven days. Just under 13,000 to over 27,000. London, again, like New York, very hopeful that things in London had reached some sort of herd effect, but it's turning out not to be the case because London is, is uh, doubled from uh, in, in, in the last week as well, in that week. London also doubled in the number of cases. And of course, we're out even higher than this now. So Tim Spector, um, the, the number of cases in the UK continues to rise at an alarming rate. But if Tim Spector's alarmed, I'm alarmed. And we are seeing figures double weekly across the country, Tim Spector. The government has confirmed that our data from our loyal app users is playing a crucial role in currently providing the most up-to-date figures. So, as I've said many times, please do download the COVID symptom tracker app. It's available in the UK, it's quite a few countries in Europe, it's available in the United States version and there is a Canadian version as well. So please download that and uh, give Tim Spector's group all the data you possibly can. The figures that we looked at overall there on about four, four, oh, oh, about more than, more than four, four and a quarter million people now filling in the COVID symptom tracker app. Um, France government no plan to order a new national lockdown. Now we saw the increase in cases in France, um, quite significant increases. These are per capita figures. So the cases are increasing, but it looks like another full lockdown is not going to happen. Um, let's hope the restrictions that are there and the public behavior is better. Now, the, the, the reason I'm hopeful about this is the public understand the need for this poster. That's what makes me hopeful, but it really does depend on, uh, on individuals complying with those restrictions and ventilating indoor areas, as I keep saying, but it's still not being, Still not being done. I've been in stuffy shops just in the last few days. You know, come on, let's get these places ventilated. Anyway, so quite what this means. So the government basically have ruled out a new complete lockdown. Russia. Uh, we believe there's a lot of suffering going on in Russia. Uh, this guy from the Russian Academy of Sciences. Well over 8,000 new cases per day. I agree it's well well over so we agree on that bit i think that infections are going to rise now and we will approach a plateau and then a gradual decline will begin there is unlikely to be a peak according to the russian academy of sciences and i'll leave you to believe that or not the plateau will probably be at the start of october um I don't know why I bother putting that in, really. Um, but that's what he's saying. Brazil, again, difficult to get news from Brazil. De death rates in April, May were terribly high. Hopes for herd immunity in some areas, but now the cases are increasing as well. So Brazil as a country, uh, kind of reminiscent of New York, London. The herd effect doesn't seem to have, uh, have happened now. Autumn is here. So, um, uh, yeah, there's no two ways about it. Cases are going to increase pretty well everywhere. Now autumn's come, in my view. I hope I'm completely wrong, but unfortunately, I don't think so. Right, just a quick splash of science before we finish. Face masks. I'm always being asked, where's your evidence for wearing face masks? Okay, let's give some. Evidence of face masks and face coverings and controlling. Outward aerosol particle emission, in other words, what you breathe out from expiratory activities from, in other words, from breathing out, right? So let's look at what this is saying here. There we are. 
Right, now this is Nature Scientific Reports, 24th of September. Um, I think this was... Uh, I can't quite remember where this was actually. I think it was a US group. Pretty sure it was a US group. Exam one, examined micron scale. So micron is a thousandth of a, of a millimeter. So this is the this is the micro droplet. This is the aerosolized size of particle that they're talking about here. But though they did measure larger particles as well. Um, So what they're bringing out into the surrounding air. So these are surgical masks, which are, aren't much better really than ordinary double layer cotton masks really. And the, the 95 uh, particulate filter masks. So um, these reduce spread by, if you're coughing, 74% uh, reduction. If you're speaking, 90% reduction. And that's the same even for the, uh, for the fairly thin uh, standard surgical masks. Now they didn't test the cotton masks because they're all different, but um, I would assume that the cotton masks are giving similar levels of uh, protection to those around an infected person as the as the surgical masks are. Um, decreased outward particle emission uh, of a coughing super spreader. Now, this was interesting. Now, they found this person who is a super spreader. And what this super spreader... What these super spreaders seem to do is, like as I'm talking to you now, I'm giving out a particular amount of droplets and aerosols, uh, water from my mucous membranes. I'm breathing that a certain amount of those out. Um, but what they're saying is that super spreaders can breathe out a hundred times more droplets just through the just the way their anatomy and physiology works. So um, if I'm just breathing out a normal amount of aerosols, aerosolized uh, water droplets, some people could be breathing out a uh, hundred times as much, two orders of magnitude more. Or am I one of those super spreaders? I don't know. How common are these people? So what we're saying is there's a subset of the population that breathe out probably a hundred or more water aerosolized and droplet particles than the average person. They breathe out way, way more. But first of all, I don't know how we test for these people. Um, I've never heard. Well, well, I mean, you can test for them in laboratory settings because you can measure it. But I mean, I, I don't know if I'm one or not. You know, there doesn't seem to be a quick uh, test for that. So we don't know. And the other thing we don't know is, is what percentage of the population super spreaders represent or super emitters represent. So they're super emitters. They'll only become super spreaders, of course, if they're infected. So a super emitter has the potential to become a super spreader. But these people exist, they are super emitters. They're just giving out loads and loads and loads of aerosolized uh, water mucus droplets. And of course, each of those, if they're infected, has the potential to carry a virus. So presumably these people are super spreaders for all respiratory viruses. So it'd be a good idea to identify them, wouldn't it? And uh, give them appropriate health education not to spread their bugs around. Because it seems that there's this minority of people are doing a lot of the spreading. But at the moment we can't recognise them. Therefore we all have to assume that we're a super spreader and mask up accordingly. Um, uh, even though it's now optional apparently in the state of Florida. Uh, but the data is here. Right. So two orders of magnitude more than the average person. Ten times ten more. Well... Um, particularly when, when coughing. Virus contaminated fabrics can generate uh, aerosolized uh, fomites. In other words, what, what they're also saying here is when these masks have been used for a period of time, and this will apply particularly to the cotton mask, double layered cotton mask that a lot of us wear on a day-to-day -day basis, um, is they can become saturated with the virus if we've got the infection, or indeed if we've been in an infected, uh, infected area and we need to wash them regularly. So I've got about I've got about I don't know half a dozen of these masks now, and you just 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 wash them at the end of every day, uh, just so you've got a, a a clean one to put on uh, every morning, or in, indeed a couple of clean ones, or, or more than a couple of clean ones per day. Just just keep washing them. Soap and water will kill the viruses. That's the thing to remember. But keep washing them and keep reusing them, which is is absolutely fine. So that is evidence that uh, masks are working. What this paper did not do is look at the degree of protection that the mask gives the non-infected person, but we do believe it's significant because we do believe that wearing a mask 
will significantly reduce the inoculum, the amount of viral particles I would breathe in as an uninfected person, and that's going to make it more likely to give me minimally symptomatic or asymptomatic diseases that what the current evidence seems to be suggesting, although that's not based on firm science. So th there we are, that's it for today. So um, today I'm a bit concerned and indeed um, somewhat bemused by by decisions taken uh, by people authority in authority in some parts of the world. Okay, thank you for watching as always.